I thought I'd start today's lecture on a personal note, uh, not me personally, but uh, all of these people that we've been talking about in Western classical music, they're individual composers, um, so many of them that we haven't talked about, but who have we talked about? We've talked about Josquin, Deus Perez, and uh, Giovanni Palestrina, de Palestrina of the Renaissance. Uh, we've talked um, a little bit about um, Bach, not so much about Handel, we didn't listen to a whole lot of Handel's music, but we did hear Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. Anyway, uh, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, those are the ones, those are the names that we recognize. These are all real people. I mean, of course, they're dead, but these real people have emotions and feelings and expression. We've been talking about how... Uh, and what music music should express. What do we think music should do, should say? Uh, and these composers definitely had something inside of them that is to be found today in their notes on the page. When you hear their melodies, when you hear the harmony that's put together, and the rhythms and the way that their music is, uh, is written. So we have Let me read a little bit of something. Uh, assumption regarding vast stylistic differences in Western music. So each one of these style periods, his, uh, the Renaissance, Baroque, and now the classical, and we're going into the Romantic real soon. Uh, Western music for the last thousand years has been marked by constant stylistic change. Most other music of the world has been a, a bastion uh, against change. Most People want traditional music, the Japanese traditional music, African traditional music. That music has not gone undergone a whole lot of change, and they don't want it to. They want it to remain uh, their part of their heritage and their tradition. So, why is this? Uh, while the, uh, uh, most other musical world has been a bastion against change, even as, even as the world around it has undergone great change, why has it changed? Why has Western music changed? Well. One of the uh, ideas is the developing concept of the composer, and that's what we're talking about, the intrusion of ego, the ego of the composer. Composers desire to create something original, a primal egocentric urge that begets self-expression. In this egocentric approach to art, styles change as the world changes. Okay, so the world is changing. We're in the Enlightenment here. And pretty soon we're going into the uh, industrial age, the, the Romantic period, um, and then into the 20th century. Things really start to change rather rapidly. Uh, we're talking about Western Europe in America eventually. Uh, the three composers that I want to mention in this lecture are from the Viennese school. So let's concentrate on that right now. Just a few things here. About the time that Bach was in his 50s uh, or 40s, uh, a young boy left his home at six years old. His father decided that where he lived in Austria, in the rural village of Vororan in Austria, he had no chance. And he noticed that since the family was musical, nobody knew how to read music, but they loved to sing with their uh, family members and the neighbors. And little Haydn, little Franz, had talent. So his father sent him to go live with uh, a, a, a relative in a, in a larger town who uh, had musical connections and who knew a little bit more about music and music theory and the study of music. Well, he was very uh, poor and he didn't do much better there. Eventually he gained the, the uh, attention of someone else and Haydn began to step up as he grew up. Uh, his voice changed, but he was a great uh, singer, or a good singer, good enough singer to gain the attention of some of the aristocracy, uh, and eventually he got to uh, Aus uh, to Austria, um, Vienna, and he uh, studied choir, he studied uh, composition, not as much as he'd like to, but his main job was to sing in the choir, but his voice changed. So he got kicked out. He got booted out on the street. He had to survive. And Haydn went hungry. 
All his life, food was a very important issue. He wasn't like Mozart. Mozart had been taken care of. His father was a court musician and composer, and Mozart was a child prodigy. Haydn grew up struggling. He grew up learning as much as he could on the streets, making connections in the music world. Eventually, he, he hooked up with... Uh, uh, a man who wrote operas and who needed somebody to drive him around, a valet. So uh, Haydn was more, uh, I guess, grounded in the real world. Uh, he, the real world at that time, if you were a musician, said you, you needed to get patronage, you needed to get somebody to fund you. And generally, if the church wasn't going to do that, uh, more and more patronage system was coming from the aristocracy. So Haydn eventually made it all the way up into a position as a Kapellmeister with the Esterhazy family. And that was, well, he was assistant first, and then the Kapellmeister died, and he became the, uh, for 30 years, the Kapellmeister, the court composer for Paul and Ant uh, Anton Esterhazy. And these, uh, these men were very wealthy, and they had an estate outside in, uh, in the rural, far away, isolated from, from all of civilization, a beautiful estate that during the summer they would have uh, their guests come and spend the summer in the country. And Haydn was responsible for an awful lot of, uh, of music performances, writing music, and over there for 30 years he had to become original because he was isolated. Uh, he cherished his trips to, um, to Vienna and he made friends. One of his friends was our friend Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and he was born, you know, about 20, uh, 20 years later, so he was much younger than Haydn, but Haydn loved Mozart's music. You respect him, but Mozart was uh, as the book says, he had a, a wonderful childhood, and he was well-educated. Uh, his father made sure that he uh, toured around uh, all of the, the aristocratic uh, and, and important cities of Europe, Western Europe, as a child. And he was a prodigy, and he could perform uh, tricks. He could perform with uh, his hands covered. He could change keys. He could write music on the scene. Uh, on, uh, on the spur of the moment. Uh, there were lots of uh, people that were impressed by this prodigy, but Mozart, guess what? He grew up and uh, no longer was he entertaining that way, but he was so gifted. Uh, he was a, considered a genius. Most of the music that he composed, if you look at the, the original uh, compositions, the original scores, there are very few markouts, very few corrections, because Mozart envisioned heard all the music in his head before he wrote it down perfectly. And that's not true about Beethoven, who's our third composer. But before we go on to Beethoven, uh, Mozart in his latter life uh, pulled away from the patronage system that he was attached to. Uh, he did that to become more independent. He was a music musician first and uh, a businessman later. Unlike Haydn, who was a survivor and was streetwise, Mozart was not. So he pulls away, he, he loves his wife, they're married, they have a child, but he's struggling, uh, and he writes music on commission. But the last three symphonies weren't commissioned, he wrote them, and they're considered his finest. The last three, the 30, 38, no, 39, 40, and 41 of, his, of the last three of his symphonies. Um, and the one that, 30, uh, 39 is the one that we're listening to, uh, were written just on his own volition, and he received no money. As a matter of fact, they were never performed in his lifetime. And uh, he died poor um, and struggling, and it's, it's rather a shame. Uh, but uh, you think about all of these composers, and I, I tend to think about people who are around at the right time. Beethoven was. Beethoven was around just all the ingredients were right. The time, the society, the personality of the individual, um, the, the circumstances, everything came in f at the right time for a wonderful explosion of music. And I think about people like Duke Ellington who came around at the right time and who worked uh, and had the talent and the work ethic to, to create the music he did. I think of people like Jimi Hendrix uh, innovators, people who literally give their lives to music, literally give up um, the comforts and really don't care uh, about money. Some of them more than others. Uh, 
Duke Ellington w was a savvy businessman, and he was able to keep a big band going and, and create music. Uh, George Gershwin as well, um, so talented, um, so dedicated to their art, but also their craft. Um, and there's, there's lots of other ones. Uh, you, you think about Bach uh, as well. But um, let's move on to Beethoven. Now, Beethoven was, was the last one of these three of the Viennese school. Born, uh, of course, about the time when uh, Mozart was a young man. So, but Ludwig von, van Beethoven was the only one that was born in Germany. And at that time, we think Austria, Germany, what's the difference? Well, it's a big difference. Uh, in Germany, uh, he was less connected to uh, the action. Like you think about Paris being the center of fashion or L.A., the media, media center of the world, or New York. Well, Vienna was. Uh, and so these two, Franz Joseph Haydn and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, were uh, there where the action was, especially Mozart. But Beethoven had to make his way. Uh, without going into too much detail about the struggles that Beethoven went in his life, his father, his mother died when he was 16. Beethoven also had to become a man at an early age. And he studied music um, at a young age. His father was a musician. His grandfather was a musician. But his father abused him. Um, and some people think that Beethoven's later deafness came from his father yanking on, pulling on his ear and beating him. Uh, so his father eventually got his, uh, excuse me, Beethoven eventually got his father. Um, um, I don't know if it was committed or jailed, but he, he got, got out of that. And he was able to study under a musician uh, in the church uh, uh, and also at the court in Bonn, Germany, um, which is in... Um, in Germany. Anyway, I'm not sure if it's in Central, I'm not sure where it is exactly, but um, Beethoven knew if he was going to make it in music that he had to get to Vienna, so he had his teacher write him a letter of introduction and he went and he met Mozart, he met uh, Haydn, and he performed for these people. And he eventually uh, was able to catch on. Um, people thought that Beethoven, as he was a different sort of person. He was more uh, of a, uh, I guess you could say, he doesn't want to use the word himself. He says he is not a misanthrope, but a misanthrope is somebody who does not get along with people. He's not a mixer, let's put it that way. Uh, he was very dedicated to, uh, he was a virtuoso pianist, very dedicated to his music, and on that sheer talent alone he was able to assimilate into Viennese society by playing for and working in the patronage system. Now your book talks about the patronage system quite a bit and what it says about Beethoven uh, at the age of 22 he moved to Vienna where he would spend the rest of his life. He earned a comfortable living from the sale of his compositions thus he was independent of the exclusive patronage system but the patronage system was, was, was the older system and if you were a musician you needed to surviving that. So we're running out of time here. I do want to say a few more things about um, Beethoven. His three periods, the first period is uh, from 22 till 32, I, I would say uh, he established his reputation and he wrote more in the classical style. Second period, 1802 to 1824, which was the middle period where he wrote most of the masterworks, like the Fifth and the Ninth Symphonies, just incredible output of masterworks. Uh, the last period, he was totally deaf and he more, wrote more serious uh, works and more personal, deeply profound uh, works until his death.